I'd like to talk about optimization and system security. And, um, and there's very much kind of a principled uh, approach that kind of operations research and optimization provide, which is this. So all the time we build models for how a system operates. Um, so we, in this setting, we, we, we require a working model uh, and a model that's gonna also work uh, you know, if certain uh, components are disabled or degraded uh, in a way. Um, then we need, we need to model system vulnerabilities. And so this is, again, something that we really do pervasively in our, in our field uh, in terms of modeling unintentional hazards, whether they're natural disasters, malfunctions, or errors, or, or intentional threats, uh, you know, vandals, uh, criminals, uh, terrorists. And, and we usually build probabilistic models for the former and, and game theoretic models for the, for the latter. Um, and then kind of the third step in what I'd call this principled approach is, well, how do you secure the system? Uh, and here, I think we, we recognize that the system will fail, will be attacked. Uh, and so the name of the game is resilience. That is, how do you uh, design a system uh, so that after it's attacked or is subject to uh, uh, hazards, that you're able to uh, adapt and recover? Uh, and so how do you allocate scarce resources to, to make that happen? And you know, if you want sort of one source that I think uh, lays this out and ar articulates this quite well, uh, this uh, this paper by Jerry Brown et al. Uh, is uh, is quite good in that regard. And the, so the U.S. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, so they identify uh, critical infrastructure sectors, uh, and so you can see the uh, the different sectors that are that are listed here. Basically, I'm going to try to make this talk sort of uh, uh, by example, and I'll, I'll cover uh, three examples that include uh, nuclear material, uh, that include communication networks, and include uh, public health. And kind of the, the twist that maybe two-thirds of the, the talk will focus on is that kind of in, um, in optimization, what we do is we typically take limited resources. And then we allocate those limited resources to, to build a, a portfolio. And uh, I'm just think of a knapsack problem as, as one example. Um, and maybe it's a bit of a hyperbole, but not that much to say. Kind of everyone else forms pri priority lists. And why is that? And I think it's because one of the key issues is, uh, is a time dynamic implementation. And I think that's very much true in terms of uh, securing critical infrastructure. Uh, networks that you don't just secure uh, the system in a in a one shot deal after saying, "Hey, I'm subject to this knapsack constraint." And I'm going to talk about a couple different ways that this kind of arises in a, in a natural uh, sense. And so one is to, if you happen to be maximizing a super modular function subject to a knapsack constraint, then nested solutions arise in a natural way as all all. To try to talk about. And another is that if you're actually maximizing a submodular function subject to, uh, say, a cardinality constraint, then, uh, then we can run uh, a greedy algorithm uh, and not get an optimal, but get a near optimal uh, solution just by construction. And as I said, I'm going to try to illustrate these ideas with uh, a couple or three examples. All right, so the first example uh, is something I worked on uh, a little while back in terms of uh, interdicting uh, nuclear smugglers. And so there was a, a US Department of Energy uh, program called Second Line of Defense. Uh, and this initiated not long after uh, the, the fall of Soviet Union. And the, and the concern had to do with kind of loose nuclear material in former Soviet states. And so the Kind of the goal of this SLD program was to, to minimize the probability of a successful smuggling uh, attempt of sensitive nuclear material from source to destination. And here sensitive material is, uh, is highly enriched uranium or, or plutonium. And then the, the approach was that uh, radiation detectors were installed. So they were installed at, uh, at border crossings, whether they're land border crossings or, or seaports. Um, airports uh, leaving uh, 
leaving Russia. And, uh, and the question was, hey, how do we select detector locations to achieve this goal of minimizing the probability of a, a successful smuggling attempt? And the, the task was called site prioritization. All right, so the Department of Energy said, we want a priority list for, um, for these sites. Uh, you know, in the upcoming fiscal year, where should we be installing uh, radiation detectors? Uh, and, and so this, this idea of site prioritization sort of first came uh, up in, in this setting. And I should say, right, it's, uh, uh, this was a joint program with, with uh, Russia. And so it's not that the U.S. just goes to Russia and installs radiation detectors wherever we want, right? But uh, there, there, the U.S. was funding uh, a program to build these radiation detectors uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, and, uh, and so it's not that the U.S. didn't have any influence at all. And so that's why they kind of wanted this priority list because of the nature of the negotiation. And then a few years after that, we did um, uh, some work with uh, uh, DNDO is the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office. So this is uh, a Department of Homeland Security office that, uh, that kind of grew out of this uh, SLD, the Second Line of Defense program, uh, to, to not just focus on uh, locations in former Soviet states, but also uh, to, to look globally, to look at, uh, at border crossings that enter the, the U.S. And so what this is an image of is uh, the, uh, the rail network in the, in the U.S. And so what you can see is that, right, in, in this uh, sort of model, there, there are seven red nodes in Mexico. A smuggler's already gotten that far. There are seven red nodes in Canada. There's something like 10 yellow nodes in, uh, in the U.S., and uh, if you were to restrict attention to purely the rail network, we didn't, but that's what this image is, then uh, a smuggler is going to try to maximize the probability they evade detection. Uh, and then these blue dots are border crossings uh, on the Mexican and uh, Canadian border, border crossings restricted in this case just to, to rail. Okay, so let's let's think about a a mathematical uh, optimization model to, to kind of capture this context. So what we have is customs checkpoints. So these are the border crossings on the Canadian and uh, Mexican border. There's a threat scenario, which is an origin destination pair. And then there's the probability of seeing a smuggler of type omega. That is with that particular origin destination pair. And then this is actually without loss of generality, but just let's assume that the radiation detectors are perfectly reliable. Otherwise, you're just shifting things by a constant. So if the radiation detectors are perfectly reliable, then, then what one can do, uh, hey, if I'm a smuggler uh, and I'm at one of those red nodes trying to go to a yellow node, then I can look at all the blue nodes, those border crossing nodes, and say, hey, what's the maximum reliability path that gets me to the border? And then what's the maximum reliability path conditional on having gotten through the border to my destination? And so that's what this RK omega is. Um, and then XK is yes, no, do we install a detector at a border crossing? So there's just a knapsack constraint that says, hey, what's it cost to install uh, a detector at this border crossing? That's the XK. And then the, the smuggler's optimization problem is uh, embedded in this really simple max over K and S. So the smuggler knows who he is. He knows his origin destination uh, pair. And then his max over uh, K and S is, hey, what's, the, uh, what's my evasion probability? And if the XK is zero, he gets that reliability. And if the XK is one, because the detectors are perfectly reliable, uh, that drops to zero for that particular uh, border crossing. And then here, the interdictor is trying to minimize the, the overall, the unconditional uh, evasion probability. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, uh, is try to play a movie here where you, you saw this uh, was a knapsack constrained problem. In this case, it's just cardinality constrained. This is the road network instead of the rail network. Uh, crossing the, the border. Again, we've got the red and the, the yellow nodes. You don't see any blue nodes yet, and you see the maximum reliability pass. And then we're going to solve this model for a budget of one, a budget of two, a budget of three, and we're just going to keep cranking up the, the budget. And what you'll see is the, uh, uh, the optimal solutions start with installing detectors around the Great Lakes, 
Uh, and as we grow the budget, then we abandon the Great Lakes and go east of the Big Bend in Texas and now start installing radiation detectors around the Great Lakes again. And then the budget continues to grow. You abandon the Canadian border and secure the, the Mexican border. And now you're back again as your budget is slowly growing. Uh, you're installing radiation detectors around the Great Lakes again. We're going uh, east of the, the Great Lakes. And when the budget gets big enough, we're going to abandon the east coast here. And we're going to install all the detectors uh, west of the, the Great Lakes. And you can see with the red uh, paths how the, the smugglers uh, change in over time. So there we abandoned the East Coast, secured west of the Great Lakes. And now we're going to finish up by installing uh, radiation detectors along the rest of the border here. All right, so I've, I've spent more time uh, like staring at this uh, video because I'm an optimizer, right? And so I, I want to understand, hey, when the budget goes from 10 uh, installation detectors to 11 installation detectors, why is it that you abandon the, uh, the Great Lake region and shift all your detectors to like west, uh, I mean, east of Big Bend in Texas? Um, and that's fun to do, but one thing you shouldn't do is you should not show this movie to your sponsor, right? Because they don't know exactly what's going on in your in your optimization black box. All they know is you're ranging the uh, the budget that you have here. Your your solution just seems incredibly unstable, uh, and so they they kind of lose faith in uh, in what it is that we that we might be doing here. And so there's kind of a disconnect with our site prioritization task. Like we tell the sponsor, no, no, just tell us what your budget is, and then we'll figure out uh, how many, uh, uh, where to put the, the specific detectors. Uh, but the client says, no, no, we, we want a priority list. Give us the most important site and the second most important site and so forth. And then um, and we said, no, no, it doesn't work that way. But like I said, in the, in the case of uh, second line of defense in Russia, they had a, a good reason for, for wanting kind of a, a priority list. And more generally, if you secure infrastructure over time, uh, I think there's a good reason to do this. So this is a map of the, like the overall evasion probability normalized for both the rail and road network for the 48 states as the budget grows. And so the blue line, like you can see here, okay, we just secured uh, the Great Lake region. This next big jump near like say 43 detectors is when uh, the Mexican border uh, is completely full with detectors. This next big jump was when we did everything west of the, the Great Lakes and so forth. So there's a blue line and there's a red line. And so with a blue line, that's what the movie showed. Uh, the red line in contrast is saying, uh, no, they, they have to be nested. The uh, you have to you can't install and then uninstall a, a detector. They have to be uh, from uh, an ordered list. And so you can see at certain locations there's a big gap. Uh, but overall, I mean, the area between the red and the blue isn't that uh, isn't that big. Okay. So how does this notion of nestedness, like you got a knapsack problem and you bump up the budget and you keep all your old items and just possibly add a new item? How can this come about in a natural way? So here's a, a combinatorial optimization model where we're trying to maximize a gain function subject to say a knapsack or cardinality constraint. Now that gain function we're gonna assume here is super modular. So that means you know, the discrete version of convexity increasing returns to, to scale here. And we're gonna assume that the, the cost function here is submodular. And we're really gonna take a bi-criteria view that we wanna maximize gain, but we wanna minimize cost. And I've already said what mass nestedness means. So this model that I've written down here, this model one is, it's NP hard in general. However, in the back of our heads, we know that if you did a weighted sum of gain and cost, then you would be unconstrained maximization of a supermodular function and that's actually uh, tractable in polynomial time, strongly polynomial. All right, so I've said this already, but a supermodular function means that we got increase in returns to scale. Um, and uh, the cost function, for us, the cost function is typically gonna be modular. 
Okay, so coming back to the, the nuclear smugglers, this is the model that I already showed you, where we're trying to minimize uh, the overall evasion probability for the smuggler. And let's think about that. Can we cast that in this form of, uh, of a gain function? All right, so right, S, that's all the places, that's all the border locations. K is the subset that receive a detector. And our gain function we could think of as this. What's the reduction in the evasion probability relative to a completely unsecured system? So our unsecured system here, the, uh, the evader gets to pick the border crossing with the maximum evasion probability. And so that's the prob overall probability of evasion of an unsecured system. And then we secure it by uh, taking a subset K of the border crossings away from the evader. And that's the reduction in evasion probability. And it turns out that you can prove that this is a supermodular function. All right, so what does supermodular have to do with this idea of nestedness? Right? And so here I'm showing on the y-axis the gain function and on the x-axis the cost function. And this m is just a slope, it's the, it's the gain in, it's the growth in the gain here uh, delta gain by delta cost. Okay. And here's a lemma with no real math and just pictures that says the following. If you've got a submodular cost function that's increasing and you have a supermodular gain function, then suppose that you have two points, K1 and K2. They're both solutions on the concave envelope of the efficient frontier. That is, so this point here is not on the concave envelope, but these kink points are on that concave envelope. Now, the lemma says that under this supermodularity, K1 intersection K2 and K1 union K2, that those slopes form a straight line. And so if you believe this lemma, then we got nestedness, right? It means that... Uh, Obviously, the intersection is a subset of the union, and the fact that we have a straight line there means that uh, that we have nested kink points uh, on this uh, concave envelope of the Pareto efficient frontier. So here's a theorem that uh, that simply captures the essence of that lemma and says, hey, if you've got extreme points on the concave envelope of the efficient frontier, then one is a subset of the other, uh, and hence. Uh, they're nested. Okay, so going back to uh, our original problem, this problem is NP hard, right? There's a particular budget value here where B is Pareto optimal. There's nobody in this uh, orthant of having uh, a smaller cost and a larger gain, but B is not on the concave envelope of the efficient frontier. And in fact, that vertical distance is exactly a, a duality gap, right? However, uh, these solutions A, C, and E, they are on the concave envelope of the efficient frontier. That theorem says we're guaranteed that they're nested. And on top of that, those are exactly the solutions that we can find in strongly polynomial time. But that is by optimizing a weighted sum of, uh, of the objectives. So when you're trying to harden infrastructure, this is a really useful result that says, hey, whatever that budget increment is that gets me from A to C, that's a really natural budget increment, right? I, I don't really need more budget until you can afford to get me from A to C so that I can get an optimal nested solution. All right, so kind of like a kind of like hockey, this is gonna come in thirds. Uh, so this is for the, the first third uh, and, you know, we don't want to just form optimal portfolios. We want to be able to have nested solutions for reasons I've said. One reason, one way that can come up is if you happen to be maximizing a supermodular function, this increasing return to scale. Uh, there's other examples that involve graph clustering, that involve chance constrained optimization. I mean, the supermodularity is something that, uh, that shows up with some frequency. And, um, you know, if you, you've seen results in Markov uh, decision processes where you talk about like monotone policies, well, this is just a monotone policy with a binary vector is exactly nestedness. So we haven't talked about this next bullet yet, but that's 
that's coming now. So instead, if we just switch the polarity of the supermodular function, instead have a submodular function, then that's decreasing returns to scale. And here we're going to get to use a, a classic result of, uh, of Nimhauser et al, where we can run a greedy algorithm and get a one minus one over E uh, constant factor guarantee. All right, so brand new example. We're going to try to detect cell phone viruses. So the, uh, the first cell phone viruses was named Kabir. Uh, and it was designed for uh, the Simeon uh, Nokia uh, uh, operating system from, from way back. Uh, and it spread through Bluetooth. Uh, and so Kabir, there was uh, an outbreak at the World Athletic Championships in uh, 2005, like literally in the stadium. Um, and so that was when one of the first uh, cell phone viruses uh, was, was produced. Uh, and the, the writers of that were good enough to put the source code uh, on, the, on the web so that there were all, all sorts of people grabbed that and, uh, and built uh, more viruses off of that. So this contact network that we're going to think about is going to be a contact network of cell phones where their vertices and their edges. And so then a, a virus is going to be initiated at a, at a single vertex. There's going to be a known probability mass function in our model for that. And then, so right, we could, uh, as I was saying we, back here, we, we could have things spread through internet, through Bluetooth, or through MMS. And so like when I send you a text message that says, uh, you know, hey, it was great to see you at the workshop. Uh, hey, check out this link. Then you shouldn't click on that link, right? Because uh, that that could involve a, a virus. And so, uh, you know, text message is one way to, to, to send viruses or try to get you to download a virus. And that goes through MMS. And so that's not peer to peer. Uh, however, uh, we we don't have bandwidth to uh, to monitor all cell phones in the network, and even though that message is going through a gateway, like a well written virus is going to evade detection by the uh, by the carrier. So I'm going to talk about a couple combinatorial problems here, where we could either try to maximize the probability that we detect a, a virus with by a given time point, or just try to minimize the expected uh, detection time, right? And so the kind of the virus spread model matter, matters here. Let's take that given as given for a second. So T naught is going to be a time threshold. We've got a contact network with hand-held uh, devices uh, with vertices. Edges are, it's not a fully connected network. Not everyone uh, talks to, to everyone. It's a sparse network. And then S are going to be honeypot nodes where we install uh, detectors. All right, so as a sort of the system manager, we can monitor a subset of, uh, of handsets within our bandwidth. So T sub S is going to be the first passage time for this stochastic process of uh, replicating viruses to hit the uh, set S. And so in this first model, uh, as I said, I want to maximize the probability that we detect the virus before some T naught. And T naught could be a, a time that is governed by, hey, when does the, uh, the thing really well, literally go viral in terms of uh, uh, spreading pervasively on the, on the network, or we could minimize the expected time. And we're just cardinality constrained here. Okay, so we had a, a really nice data set from a large Asian uh, telecom. Uh, where this, the market share was about 50% uh, uh, in that country. Uh, and what they'd done, they had sampled uh, about 5 to 10% of transactions over a three-year period. Uh, and those included calls, text, uh, anonymized, uh, and even had like handset or cell tower data, handset type, and, and so forth. So here's a little bit on that uh, data set. So if we only look at the first month, then there were about 13 uh, million uh, nodes that showed up and about 30 million edges. This was the average degree and the max degree. So someone in one month called over 2,000 different people. Um, and over three months, up to 12 months, you can see that this grows to about uh, roughly 50% of this unnamed Asian uh, country's population. And, um, and you can see a little bit of, uh, of the nature of the, of the network. Okay, so here's a replicating virus 
it gets inserted at a random node. And then what could happen is uh, we could send text messages to recent contacts uh, that are one hop away from, from this node. Now, not everyone may uh, click on the link and, and get a virus. It'll only be a subset of those, uh, but then those can spread to their neighbors and, and so forth. So the submodular function here means that, hey, if you are trying to maximize detection probability, as you increase the number of nodes where you have honeypots, well, then the, the de detection probability grows. But if it's submodular, then the, the delta, the increase in the detection probability is a, uh, is a decreasing function, so diminishing returns. So optimization of this is hard in general, uh, cardinally constrained optimization, but uh, we can run a greedy heuristic where we say, oh, huh, we only get to install one honeypot. I want to maximize detection probability. Where do I put it? Oh, now that thing is fixed, uh, and I get to install a second honeypot, and I want to maximize detection probability. Just greedy algorithm, check all the solutions. Where do I put it? And, and repeat. And this is when we get this 63% uh, uh, constant factor guarantee. So the problem's hard, but we can get a constant factor. Okay, so here is the kind of the main result here in terms of submodularity is if I have a virus who's got a spread, and I haven't said a lot about the spread model per se, but this theorem is true really broadly. Uh, if the initial point of the virus, the initial node or set of nodes that are infected, they don't know where the honeypots are. And when the virus spreads, it doesn't know where the honeypots are. Then you can prove that the, uh, uh, the probability, the hitting time, uh, the probability that the hitting time is less than this threshold is a submodular function. And so this notion of decreasing uh, marginal returns seems kind of natural in this setting. And if instead you're trying to maximize, uh, I mean, minimize expected time to detection, then that's a supermodular uh, function. All right, so as I said, these, these results hold really broadly. Um, I mean, one of the hitches here is that uh, if you think about this as a Markov chain, there's, there's an exponential number of states in the Markov chain. It's the subset of nodes that are currently infected. So we can't compute these um, exactly, th th these uh, performance measures exactly in that setting. And so what we're going to do is use a sample average approximation where we just use Monte Carlo sampling to say, oh, huh, where was the initial uh, node or set of nodes that were infected? And then that's allowed to spread over time. Uh, and so we're just going to maximize the empirical uh, probability that we detect it before some time threshold and draw IID observations of that spread. Right? And so this function is, uh, is submodular because this is a probability. OK, so I'm just going to show you a brief kind of snapshot of some computation. So we didn't do compute on the uh, those entire uh, networks. We did some downsampling where the uh, like a two core is uh, no leaf nodes are allowed. So delete all leaf nodes, uh, and you might need to do that recursively. Uh, but finally, you get down to a network that has no leaf nodes. That's a two core. So the twenty core is the anal the analog where you have to have a degree of 20 for each node, and you can see the size of these. So I can, I'm going to show computation on this graph one with, uh, you know, 5,000 uh, vertices and, you know, 140,000 uh, edges. And I didn't say so, but that problem I wrote down on the last slide, you can solve with a mixed integer program. There's like a covering style formulation that is really natural here. But the other thing we're going to do is we're going to run a greedy heuristic. We can just run the greedy heuristic on the sample average approximation. So I'm going to, so don't wince when you see the next slide. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of numbers, but you only need to look at the colors. So let me tell you what's going on here. So what we have is we have uh, the probability, I send you a text, the probability that you get the virus when I try to send it to you is 0.3. And so I could install 100 honeypots or 200 honeypots or 300 honeypots. I could run a sample average approximation with 5,000 samples or 10,000 samples or 50,000 samples. 
And then after I saw that solve that sample average approximation, I can now I've got a fixed set of honeypots. No more combinatorial optimization. I can select a sample size of like 10 million. And then I can estimate the uh, detection probability before the threshold um, for the optimal solution and for the heuristic greedy solution. And so I'm going to say something that sounds wrong, which is greedy beats optimal. So every time, wherever the blue is, is where the optimal solution is. And every time the greedy solution beat the optimal solution, except this one time where this got 0. 0.4816 versus 0. 0.4815. And the reason greedy can beat optimal is because they're not the same objective function, right? So one objective function has a sample of 50,000, right? So it optimizes with respect to 50,000, but it over adapts where it puts the honeypot to those 50,000 scenarios. And then we do add a sample testing with, uh, with 10 million samples and greedy does better than optimal on that out of sample. So we had this constant factor for guarantee, but something is going on here that greedy uh, works really well. And I don't know what. So I don't have a theoretical explanation for why greedy is performing so well here. I do know, know this, that it's not simply the case that the problem is easy, right? You could say, hey, what about other heuristics like a highest degree heuristic? Let's put the honeypot there or use highest degree with discount or have some measure of the, the shortest average distance, like how many hops it takes to, to get somewhere. And this top line is the, the greedy solution. And then these are three heuristics. And you might say that the red line and the, uh, this sort of aqua marine line look pretty close. However, if you say, look, I want 85% coverage, then that takes just shy of 600 honeypots uh, on this problem with about 6,000 nodes. But if you use this heuristic, then you need more than 800 honeypots to get that same uh, level of coverage. So it's not that the problem is just easy. All right, so we're kind of through two thirds of the, uh, the hockey match. So, so in the first third, there's sort of qualitative differences between the first third and the, uh, the second third here. So the smugglers, they could see where those radiation detectors were. If you've ever seen them, they're, they're kind of plain as day uh, on the border crossing and uh, so they, they know where radiation detectors are. And in a Stackelberg game, they say, oh, huh, that's where you put the radiation detectors. I'm going to choose a path that tries to avoid them. Right? So and it's precisely that smart behavior of the smuggler that means if you have a small number of detectors deployed, you don't get that much action because they can avoid them. Uh, and that's where you get this super modularity is the increasing returns to scale is because like once you start to uh, uh, secure like the great angle that comes from the Great Lakes, then uh, then you have a significant decrease in the evasion probability. Or there's a big desert in Mexico. And so if you go east of Big Bend in Texas, you've taken out a big solid angle. The second third, the virus wasn't smart. It's not like the virus picked an insertion point that recognized where the honeypots were. And it's not like it had a spread model that tried to avoid the, the honeypots. And so in that setting, we got this submodular uh, function. So in both cases, we're kind of aiming for the best of both worlds, which is we want a priority list, a rank ordered list, um, and we want optimality. So in the first case, when we had the supermodular function, then we got exact optimal solutions but we didn't get them at every budget increment. They only came at certain uh, budget increments and we couldn't say anything about near optimality in between. In the second case with the, sub the submodular uh, maximization, we're not guaranteed optimality. However, we get a full nested list. I, I mean, the greedy algorithm is just adding one at a time and therefore uh, we have a fully ordered list. All right. So I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about some recent work that we've done uh, with the city of Austin, Texas, in terms of uh, staged alert systems for COVID. 
So this is a, uh, a risk-based guideline uh, that you know, Austin published in the middle of May 2020, where there are five different stages. Stage five is the strictest version of lockdown. Stage one is uh, sort of the completely open normal. There's certain behavior for high risk people with comorbidities and there's uh, behavior uh, guidelines for lower risk uh, individuals, as well as businesses and, and workplaces as to what, what they can do. So these are really pervasive. Harris County is the, the county uh, that includes uh, Houston, Texas. They had a four level uh, alert system. Uh, this is uh, an alert system in the, in the UK, uh, the state of Colorado. Uh, you know, we've seen four or five, they had six, uh, kind of in the sense of spinal tech, they had six uh, different alert levels. Here's uh, an alert system from, uh, from South Africa. So how do we know what our stage is, like in terms of stage one, stage two, the strictest lockdown or, or not? So in New York, they use seven different indicators involving hospital admissions, uh, hospital census, deaths. The state of Illinois tracks positivity, hospital admissions. Uh, you know, what's the, uh, the use of uh, surge beds, ICU beds, ventilators? So France had a system I'll come back to that involved uh, the incidence of infections, um, among 100,000 people and uh, how, how occupied are ICU beds. Uh, there's uh, a Global Health Institute at Harvard that, that had a, a recommendation as well. So what we did with uh, Austin is we just tracked one metric and we tracked the seven day moving average of hospital admissions. And then we, we built a model that said, oh, if the, uh, what we're gonna try to do is minimize the amount of time spent in the strictest stage of lockdown, but we're gonna have a chance constraint that says we want the, uh, the probability that we uh, exceed hospital capacity to be uh, small, like 5% or smaller. And so we built these, uh, these thresholds that said, if you're five or under, you could be in blue between five and 20 and yellow. If you have more than 70 uh, uh, ad COVID admissions to the hospital per day, then you need to be in the strictest red uh, lockdown. So this is a, a screenshot from, uh, I guess, yesterday of uh, a public facing dashboard in Austin that has exactly that flag of, uh, this is a, a plot of seven day admission, seven day uh, average of uh, admissions to the hospital starting in March, 2020 and running through uh, now. I know things are kind of small here, but you can uh, you can see that the current is uh, seven day moving average of hospital admissions for COVID is 11 patients. Uh, this is a peak that happened right around 4th of July last year, Memorial Day, people uh, uh, in 2020 uh, went out and, and partied. And then this is, uh, things really started to take off after Thanksgiving and peaked in uh, early to mid uh, January in, in Austin before coming back down. So this is a slightly uh, more blown up version of that uh, hospital admissions. And here, so this is on the, on, the, on the website there is exactly these levels. Hey, if we're in between five and 15, we're in blue, 15 to 30, uh, yellow uh, and so forth. And so what, what underlies this is um, a compartmental SEIR style model where you have susceptible, exposed, you've got people that are asymptomatic or symptomatic uh, in a pre and in, a, uh, in an actual symptomatic. Symptomatic folks might go to the hospital. Some of them will go to the ICU. Uh, most of them will recover and some will die. All right, so this is a, a classic uh, model in uh, mathematical epidemiologists that I imagine you all have heard about. Um, we take that model and we clone it with 10 different age risk groups. So there's people with uh, high risk in terms of comorbidities and there's people with low risk and they have different contact uh, rates. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but I mean, there are essentially underlying differential equations that, uh, that we discretize here. And hey, how many are in the susceptible compartment in each age risk category? Uh, and then how many leave the susceptible compartment? And there's kind of a bilinear term there that is the driver here between the number that are susceptible and the number that have been 
uh, exposed or are infectious and asymptomatic or are infectious and symptomatic. And the model is actually initiated with one single individual uh, who's 18 to 49 with low risk and it grows from there. So there was a variable here that's blue. This XTI is a binary variable that says, what stage are we in? And then, so beta is kind of the coefficient that's a driver of transmission. Uh, and then this phi is a contact matrix. And so if we're in the red stage, then we have lower transmission than if we're in the blue stage, uh, for example. And this X is a binary variable plucking that out. And then we're gonna optimize these thresholds of what does it take to be in green, blue, yellow, or orange. Uh, and that's gonna turn on these indicators. And I'm just gonna say the model quickly here, which is we wanna minimize the expected amount of time because this is a stochastic simulation that we spent in red versus orange versus yellow stages of lockdown. We have embedded here these mathematical epidemiology constraints for different scenarios. And there's a chance constraint that here I've written in the following way, ICU, that's how many people, how many heads in beds in the ICU, uh, some overall age and risk groups. So now it's the total, take the max over time. You wanna make sure that that largest number is below the number of available beds in uh, the ICU. And so we have a chance constraint that says we wanna be 95% sure that that's true. Otherwise we wanna minimize the time we spend in lockdown. So I mentioned this French system and I mentioned the Harvard Glo Global Health Institute system. Uh, and so like, how well does our system compare, right? They say, hey, look at the current case count. Uh, if the number of people per 100,000 uh, is less than one, it's between one and 10, 10 and 25, bigger than 25, these are the stages you should be at, right? France has a different system. And here's uh, just one plot to show how well we do. All right, so this purple, let's start there. So purple is the incidence based. On the x-axis, it's how many people are in the ICU at the peak. 331, that's the number of beds in the Austin area across the three major hospital systems. These purple dots are well to the left of that. So the, the Harvard-based system is highly reliable uh, but you can see the amount of time spent over 300 stochastic simulations in lockdown uh, in the, the strictest red stage. Okay. So on the other hand, if you look at the percent incidence, uh, I mean the percent ICU, so that's the French system, then of these like olive plots of those 300, there are a lot to the right of the, of the, of the budget. So this is not particularly reliable. Um, and it spends a fair amount of time in lockdown. Then we said, suppose you just have two stages. You, you run our optimization model, but you only have access to two stages. Well, it, it's reliable, but you spend a lot of time in lockdown. And then this line right here is the four stage system that we optimize. There's just a few dots to the right of the, of the budget. And we spent an average of about 14 days in lockdown. So we had a rule that if you go into lockdown, you have to spend at least two weeks there. So you can't just be flipping back and forth between uh, different stages and, uh, and losing sort of public confidence in the, in the system. And that's why there's this sort of stratification uh, in, in two week increments. There's one other here that if we make, make the mistake of optimizing for total hospital capacity and not ICU capacity, we spend very little time in lockdown, but it's not reliable. All right, and this is, this is a projection that we made back in, uh, in early October. Uh, the red dots are actually uh, observed hospital admissions, observed heads in beds. Uh, this is the flag like you saw on the public uh, dashboard. And then there's a point projection here and there's uh, 300 stochastic simulations. So the left is hospital admissions. That's what drives the policy. The right is actual heads in beds in the ICU. And the sort of Salvador Dali-like thing is uh, if you pick a date, 
then the vast majority of the 300 scenarios are in the orange stage, but there's a few scenarios in the red stage here. And as we go on, then we're in the yellow and the blue stages primarily. And this is March 21st of this year. This is what actually happened. So we already knew this peak corresponded to July. And then this was the peak that, I mean, roughly corresponds to the projection that we had uh, back in October. All right, so this is the final slide. Uh, in the, I've already talked about the first and second third in terms of uh, you've got a smuggler trying to avoid detectors and a super modular uh, gain function. You have a, a, a sort of dumb virus that's not paying attention to uh, avoiding detectors and that led to a submodular function. In this final third, we didn't have any special structure we found. Uh, we just needed to run a simulation optimization and kind of get an answer now. Uh, and so in this case, it really was uh, just sort of a brute force. So thanks for your attention. I'll stop there. <laughs>